Hello and welcome to Dice Punks, a tabletop role-playing podcast where we focus on playing full campaigns in less well-known systems. This week, we are gathering to celebrate the summer solstice with a one-shot episode set in the Old Gods of Appalachia tabletop system by Monty Cook Games. Hello and welcome. I'm Robin, your old GM of Appalachia, and join me are... Hi, I'm Adam, and I'll be playing Edith Eaton, a.k.a. Ed, a rebellious explorer who serves the green. Hi, I'm Drew, and I'll be playing Fielding Cladwell, a beholden speaker who cannot escape the darkness. I'm Dez, and I'll be playing Silas Greenaw, a wood-touched blacksmith who crafts powerful objects. And I am Nick. I will be playing Bascom B.B. Burton, a charming sage who knows Jack. Thank you, players. Before we dive into the episode, there are a few important things to note. Old Gods of Appalachia is a horror anthology podcast written by Cam Collins and Steve Shell. Familiarity with the podcast is not required for listening to this episode, but I do hope that you'll join the Old Gods family after listening. And if you feel so inclined, complete what they call your social media ritual by giving them a follow. This tabletop session will do its best to honor the source material, which is to say that we'll be leaning into the sumptuous folk and ecological horror that makes Old Gods of Appalachia such an incredible listening experience. A full list of content warnings can be found in the episode notes. So, are you feeling brave, listeners? Let's go. Oh, untamed Appalachia. Living, breathing beast of prowling mossy veils and misty shrouds. This wild and fearsome place we call home whose peaks have been worn by time but remain unbowed, whose veins of coal have been drawn from unwilling donor, we tread with caution, lest your ancient spirits stir with hunger, unrelenting and wild jaws snapping. We fear the lurking copper's venom from beneath slate and shell, the broken scream of timeless broods, freshly emerged from soil and slumber. We ask not how the shadows between bent trees know our names or our kens. We do not listen. But we keep our backs bent, to till and seed and harvest our blood-fertile crops, and through this toiling pact we honor that which is older than our bones and time itself. And in your unforgiving shadow, Mother Mountain, we've gathered on this longest day of the year to talk about family. Our brood. Our flesh and blood, or those not of our blood, but chosen and ordained as something deeper. They say that family seldom gathers except for weddings and funerals. And this, dear listeners, will probably be a little something of both. What I can say for certain is that this story ties our present to our past as surely as the great river flows like blood between these hallowed hills and tallers. And every ounce of it is true. Except for those little improvisations that are characteristic of a tabletop session and necessary for my privacy. 
our story begins on this summer solstice of 2024, when my sister and I visited the ruins of the old family manor to pay respects, collect some souvenirs, and ensure that we continued the work of our ancestors long ago. Our steps and voices were drowned out by the dual cicada brood. Pale nymphs hauled themselves from rich soil. The leaves of every tree surrounding that verdant clearing were weighed down with discarded husks and their adjacent reborn selves. Gold wings glinted in the canopy above us like sparks of ember from a wet wood campfire, as thousands of them whirred like a furious gale. It was impossible to move without finding ourselves covered in a few stowaways, black bodies with blood-red eyes peering up at us. We found the stone pillars that marked the ancient carriage path without issue, navigated past the brick and marble ribcage of that old, great house with well-trod familiarity. Not because we've been here before but because our very blood recalled this place. And this place, well, it recognized us too. It was a certainty we felt deep in our bones, the same way others with a gift might feel a particularly bad winter or storm coming on. But I'm starting with the ending, aren't I? The last time these two cicada broods appeared was just before the summer solstice of 1803. Back then, the bricks and marble were freshly laid, the brass fixtures glowed like tiny suns on the front wraparound porch. I don't dare utter its real name, but I'll call it Timble Manor. It held a presiding view of not just the river and the majestic blue mountains beyond, but it also peered imperiously down at the other, more modest log cabins that were rapidly metamorphosing into brick houses and rather fine establishments in their own right. You see, in this little unnamed holler, wealth and prosperity bloomed as surely as the Gallo family's iconic tobacco crop, the famous leaf with blood-red veins that burnt with smoke as smooth as butter, and tasted better than sin. Today, Timble Manor is a flutter with activity. My many, many, many times great Mima was to be wed to the hard-working eldest son of a coal mining family from the next town over. This union between the Gallo and Ward families was historic. What the wards hoped was finally a good turn in their fortune after years of working in the mines, but what looked like to everyone else a curious mismatch, likely to cover up an affair between the eldest boy Samuel Ward and Lizzie Gallows, who was as pale and soft in her youth as a spring bloom and bloodroot. We begin this tale the day of the wedding, just after dawn on the longest day of the year, as the Timble Manor household groggily stirs into a hive of activity. The servants rose well before dawn to begin their work, arranging flowers and seeding outside, or hauling lumber for a makeshift dance floor, stage, and what looks to be a tremendous celebratory bonfire in the making. Tempting, luxurious smells wafted from the kitchen for the pre-wedding gathering and the feast afterwards. The upstairs has been divided more starkly into quarters for the bride and groom and their families, with the left grand staircase leading to the groom's quarters and the right to the bride's. The overlook, which usually connects the two upstairs, has been separated by a white ribbon and a small line of flower. The more prestigious, connected, or, well, uninvited but stubborn guests also opt to arrive early. All right. I think that means I start. And, uh, Ed's here, despite being warned away uh, by one of the bride's brothers. And uh, she comes dressed in her finest, a suit consistent of men's slacks, shoes and suspenders, with a lady's blouse and a neck ribbon. And, uh, 
pretty practical hat. She's left her weapons on the porch, a little out of the way, so they won't uh, attract too much attention. You look at her, you mostly see weather in on a young woman. Or young man. Depends on your perspective. Kind of like one of those optical illusions. I've got dark brown, but otherwise unremarkable hair. Usually covered under the hat. Kept close. Tan, somewhat starting on the wrinkled skin, but young enough not to have it be too bad, despite all the time outdoors. Hard working hands. Short nails. And an unimpressed expression. Probably at this point in the day, I'm Standing off to the side, not quite glaring, but not looking too impressed either. Trying to see who all's here, what needs doing, and if I get an opportunity to have a quick conversation with the bride. I'll also note that uh, Ed's not originally from here. I've been here a little more than a decade, but uh, my family came up from further south. Never really said where. Uh, and what this means in player terms is I'm going to be attempting to uh, capture the, the accent of my IRL grandparents. If it goes wrong, uh, that's on me. Uh, I hope it'll be uh, pretty fine. But if it sounds like I'm making fun, promise I'm not. When I'm not quite arrived and i'm sure no one can see me i check my hair for the curling papers that i've slept in and pull a stray one out when i'm sure that i'm looking good and when i'm sure that people can see me i extract my pocket watch though i know what time it is i'm dressed in an iridescent not quite black suit it's not quite as iridescent and not quite as black as my eyes which seem in the right light or perhaps the wrong light to be all the way black I take out my Franklin spectacles and I polish them. I once again run my hand through my now perfectly coiffed hair. And I look around for Father Gallows, who's the person I know best at this affair. And I look at the assembled crowd and I'm not sure what I think, but I have a lot of thoughts. Silas Greenall walked out of the woods 12 years ago, following an image of Ed, without a surname or any idea of what year it was. He said he'd been in there for weeks, asked if anyone had some food spare or could direct him to his pa's farm, but his name wasn't in anybody's family bible, at least not recently. There'd been a Silas Damson, according to Dell, but the Damsons had left some time back, and nobody recalled if Silas had gone with them. Dell took Silas in, gave him work to focus on, and eventually bragged him up to anyone who'd come to the smithy. Said his hands glowed when he worked. Said he occasionally used his spare materials to make strange and useful things. Said he must have made a bargain in them woods to be so natural at metal craft and so slow at anything else. Twelve years hasn't made much difference except that Dell's doing the social parts of smithing and don't hold the hammer himself no more. And I have arrived here to... Uh, bring the rings which I was commissioned to craft. So I see that there are some weapons by the door and leave my sledgehammer beside them. <laughs> Walk in carrying a you know, small fabric pouch and uh, attire that is not appropriate for a wedding, but like fine, I guess you're here. <laughs> hmm. I should mention, I also see the weapons, and I leave my flintlock pistol by the door with great hesitation, and before I lay it down, I lay down a small velvety cloth, also black. <laughs> Christ, what an asshole. A servant sees you doing this, and they look both confused and slightly irate, as though confused at why so many people are bringing weapons to a wedding. <laughs> but they see you lay down the cloth and immediately tame their face into something of due respect and reverence. <laughs> I interpret only admiration. Sure, we'll go with that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my name is Bascom Burton, although most folks call me BB. Uh, most folks that consider me a friend anyways, which is most folks. Uh, I'm a veteran of the uh, Revolutionary War, which is common knowledge around these parts, but um, what's not quite so commonly known is exactly what I did during the war, which is 
be a spy. It's um something that uh, you know the knacks that I learned as a, a young and uh, served me well with, um, and uh, I do share that affinity for those few knacks with uh, Miss Laura Lynn Ward, uh, sister of the bride. Um, I am dressed in my best finery, um, complemented by shock of white hair, white beard, full bushy, um, lots of smile lines. Um, but I do have a variety of blades secreted upon my person and uh, flintlock pers- uh, pistol that I just do take in with me. Because um, if anybody's going to find that, then they're already getting a t- little bit too personal. <laughs> Before we pass into the house, uh, you glance at the weapons and then a little bit off to the side and see a large white dog blazing on the porch. His eyes are distant as it awaits the arrival of some master or another. Hmm. All right, well, I give a friendly little wave to the dog um, and move along. I, uh, I'm i here because uh, I tend to see things that most folks don't. So uh, using my ability to see the unseen, I automatically perceive creatures and objects normally invisible, unsubstantial, or hidden via magic. Would that apply to this dog? Is I mean, I'm already suspicious of the dog. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it uh, definitely has a touch of the uncanny about it okay uh, you gaze at it for a little longer and realize that it's uncanny but it's a dog it is <coughs> has fur has teeth uh on <laughs> in every way it is a dog it's not something else parading as a dog mm. and this it doesn't is a have bit, extra teeth yeah it doesn't have extra teeth or any extra limbs or limbs up in the wrong way like what you've heard from some of these hills it strikes you as a little strange all right I've got my eyes on you, dog. It doesn't look at you. (laughs) Do you go into the house? I do, yeah. I take it that everyone's kind of arriving around the same time. No one's really gone upstairs just yet. I know we have Mm -hmm. interest in visiting with varying members of the families. Uh, But as you guys arrive in sort of the entryway... Um, it is a very sumptuous interior, all hardwoods, brass pictures. Two grand sweeping staircases rise from either side of the floor with a majestic overlook, kind of like a catwalk, uh, splitting the middle of the room, and tall ceilings as well. It feels very open and spacious and kind of unusual during these times, especially for tobacco farmers. As you mill about in the entryway, perhaps noticing that the rug is perhaps too nice to be walking on with muddy shoes, one of the servants approaches you, carrying a big book uh, with a bit of parchment on top of it. This is clearly the guest registry Mm -hmm. where you're able to sign in and leave a message for the bride or groom or both, as the case may be. Um, and they pass it to you with a little quill that's already been dipped in an ink well. All right. Well, I'll go ahead and sign my name with a flourish, um, along with just uh, a message. Um, uh, honored to be here. Um, hope your love reigns eternal. I signed the book with no note. And I sign it Senator Fielding Cladwell. So confident am I that my race is going to go <laughs> just the way it ought. This is going to age well. <laughs> They'll be so glad to have it when uh, when the time comes. I put down a mark in the book that is not quite just an X, not quite a full-on sigil, but it is known who who would make that mark. As the book starts to get past you, Ed, the servant does a double take and seems to recognize you and moves to remove the book, but is not quite successful. (laughs) I do grab the book as soon as it's turning toward me so that when the servant goes to pull it away, uh, you know, I'm like tugging back the other way. And, uh, you know, I I sign it EE. As a result of this minor conflict (laughs) shall we say Uh, the book falls open and a large leaf falls out and kind of drifts to the floor Mm. i crouch down to pick it up 
I was going to say, I am absorbed signing my little message. So I put EE and then in kind of a blocky, uh, you know, unpracticed hand. And my message is just, let me know if I'm needed. (laughs) (laughs) Um, so, Des, you were saying that you were crouching down. Did any of the players take interest in this yeah, leaf? Yeah, I'm, cr- I'm crouching down to pick up the leaf. Okay. So, this leaf is something called a cipher. Mm. Uh, mm. It is just, for all appearances purposes, it's just an old, dry leaf. But it, it's something called a gift from the green. Now, what's interesting about the system is that the heart and soul of it in many ways are these ciphers, which are essentially one use items that allow for a particular ability upon use. And after that, they're consumed. A uh, point of order question. Mm-hmm. Would I recognize it as a cipher? Why don't you roll might for that? Sure. First roll. For reference, <laughs> everyone, Robin has been kind enough to allow me the use of some variant rules. Uh, it would Des? normally be variant in- rules. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Shocking! It's it's the most in keeping thing about my character. Uh, <laughs> uh, do you care to elaborate on that a little bit? Specifically, <laughs> as far as this role goes, uh, all of my magic stuff, such as I have it is related to might rather than int uh those being two of the three stats and the third being speed so uh what's the difficulty on this would you say and in terms of you know deciding whether or not to put effort or what whatever into things that's gonna be fairly easy for you it could be eased even further if uh one of your fellow players with the sight happened to glance at it as it was falling. <clears throat> I would love to do so. <laughs> <laughs> to say, I am currently strong arming a servant so that I can write a vaguely threatening message in the guest book, so I am oblivious. <laughs> yeah, you're, uh, you're a little um, distracted, Occupied. to say the least. Yeah. So helping in this case takes up an action, and it can ease the task by one step. Uh, so every role these players are going to be making this session has a difficulty associated with it. And in order to ter- determine whether or not they are successful, they have to roll equal to or above a target number, which is the difficulty times three. In this case, it requires focus, but most people can usually look at this and realize there's something special about this leaf. Uh, so it's a difficulty of two that has been eased down to a difficulty of one. So you're looking to roll more than a three on a d20. Yeah, no, I rolled a 13, so we're good there. <laughs> you're more than good. Huh. So looking at this uh, leaf, you have the sense that it would be most useful to someone who can use the green or commune with the green. Uh, I will hold it until Ed is done signing the book and then hand it to him. I think you dropped this. Ah, thank you kindly. And I'll take the leaf with a mildly significant look uh, and uh, stow it in one of the uh, several different uh, pockets and belt pouches uh, that I have incongruously over my quote-unquote finery. Adam, I'm going to have you roll a d6 to determine the level of of the gift um, of the green, the cipher that you've just obtained. This will determine its level and how powerful it is. That is a three. Okay. Uh, So the strength of your cipher is going to be five. It's 1d6 plus two. So you have a level five cipher. Uh, When you wish to use it, you have the strange sense that crumbling the leaf in your palm until it becomes absolute dust will unlock its powers. And for a number of hours equal to the cipher level, so five hours, Mm -hmm. uh, you'll gain an asset in all tasks relating to the green. All right. Well, that's pretty great. Uh, I give Silas, I believe it was. Yes. I give Silas 
a tight but sincere smile uh, as I uh, stow the leaf. Off camera, we discussed character arcs and what might count as progress towards it. Uh, in as much as two years before arriving in town, an image of Ed guided me out of the woods. I uh, have a debt to her. Uh, and it's more perhaps than any single act can repay, but this may be a start. Yeah, so your character arc is to repay your debt to Ed, which may take a lot, but this is a step in the right direction. Uh, so what's cool about the system is that it prioritizes character stories and the story itself and rewards you for it. So you will get XP for this. Um, this is a step in the direction of your character arc. So that's good for two XP. Sweet. Note that down. Just racking up the first, first roll, yeah, yeah. first uh, deliverance of XP. I guess I can claim the distinction of being pettiest first. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the wrestling with the book was a brilliant, <laughs> brilliant act. Petty percent. <laughs> uh, so at this point, you've all signed the get the guest registry, left a message, as much or a little <laughs> as you wanted for the bride or groom. So what now? I mentioned to the servant that I have the rings and uh, who's keeping track of them that I should hand them off to. The servant nods almost absentmindedly before kind of focusing in on you as though belatedly realizing what you've said. Everyone's rushing around. They're all kind of looking at you more Carried. like you're part of the scenery than an actual human. <laughs> uh, and upon saying that, they kind of nod yes, yes. Um, and gesture for you to come with them. All right. So they lead you past the two grand sweeping staircases to a very back small door. Um, it's clear that this is meant to be one of those servant staircases that allows them to pass discreetly through the house. It's a little unconventional that they're bringing you with them, but there's a look of annoyance on their face as they're doing so that makes it clear that this is not their first <laughs> impulse uh, you make your way through the claustrophobic servant's staircase down into the kitchens past that into a quiet pantry where there is another servant kind of in the fetal position sitting down hugging her knees to her chest clearly trying to have a quiet cry in the pantry, but having been disrupted in the process. She looks gaunt. There's dark circles under her red-rimmed eyes as she looks up at you. And as you watch, she rapidly produces a well-worn handkerchief and dabs at her eyes, blows her nose, and tries to get herself presentable, wiping her hands off on her apron as she rises. Um... And she looks at you and says, uh, um, "How can I can how can I help you, sir?" Ah, uh, I have the rings for the wedding. Oh yes, yes. I'm sorry. I was supposed to be in charge of this, but <sighs> she takes a breath to steady herself. You all right? Uh, it's just she looks at the the servant that led you in and then back to you, but just a lot going on. I, I'll take those rings. If there's anything I can do to help. Well, Let me know. She looks at the servant again, and they shake their head once as they try to silence her. <laughs> but thankfully, this time she ignores them. And says, oh, uh, it's just my friend. She was supposed to be helping today, but I think something terrible has happened to her. Where do you think is she, should she be here, or what? What's I sort of trail off, failing to, like, express a thought because I'm failing to formulate a thought. Well, Cassie was supposed to help the cake, but about a week ago she just went missing, and everyone said that she went to Hotchkiss, but she wouldn't have left without saying bye to me. And, uh, one night I heard, uh, and, uh, 
I'm going to... <laughs> You're going to hate me for this. <laughs> I need you to roll for intelligence. And it's important to note at this point that not only is it your dump stat, but the good news is that unless you feel inclined to apply effort, intelligence doesn't really play a role in the role. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, what is the difficulty? Or is that something that I can get to know in advance? I'm going to say it'll be a little challenging. You have the sense that... And also, a... is this a matter of uh, positive social interaction? This is a matter of positive in the sense that it's reassurance. <laughs> so, so step that be... difficulty up one. Yay! Because okay. I have an inability there. <laughs> so what I was going to say... Oh, you're, oh, wait, no, this is not working in your favor. I misunderstood. No, oh, correct. no. Um, <laughs> well, because, because I'm that weird woods-touched child. Yeah, yeah you're, you're a bit unnerving to look at. As, <laughs> I, I think or it's be around. More... I think it's just that, like, there is a stillness and sort of, well, outside of Appalachia, it might be sort of a fayness mm -hmm. to me. Ah, uh, that people don't know if I'm paying attention or not, and it doesn't help that I'm kind of dumb. So spacing <laughs> out and, like, being very still can look a lot similar. Yeah, that's fair. And mm -hmm. I, I think Amelia, uh, the servant's name, picks up on that a bit because she kind of falters in her speech as she's looking at you. And you can tell she's grappling both with the desire to get this off of her chest to a stranger that might be able to help her and has more means than she has. And the fact that you're you. Like, if this gets reported to the wrong person, it could have consequences for her. Well, for what it's worth, I rolled an 18. Excellent. So you have really uh gone over this difficult task um that is a success in fact, Woo! well this is not an attack so sometimes there's special rolls mm -hmm. when you roll especially well um so 17 and up to 20 uh naturally in a conflict would net you some bonuses here but because you're just talking to this poor girl she just looks at you and says well, i heard her screaming where, where? She looks down at the ground and back up to you, searching for something, maybe some type of reaction or insight into how you might respond to this. The first word out of her mouth is everywhere. The second word out of her mouth is ground. So, she's somewhere, and it ain't necessarily here. I just think something bad happened. I've heard it, well, I've heard it almost every night. <sighs> Investigating things ain't my uh, strong suit, as we know. But, uh, Ed may be able to help. Please, I'll take anything, I'll take any, any help you're willing to offer, good sir. I don't have much, but I'm good at baking bread. Um, and, uh, please don't, please don't tell the gallows. She looks to the other servant at this, who is completely checked out of the conversation. <laughs> Won't say nothing. Thank you. Um, of course. My name's Amelia Blackwood. If you if you ask anyone, uh, they'll be able to tell you where I am. Honestly, it's it's been here more often than not. But if you hear anything, let me know. Uh, her name was Cassie Carter. She she always wore the most beautiful yellow ribbon in her hair. Um, she's tall, not too tall, uh, not like Lizzie, but tall enough, and uh, had the cutest upturned button nose you ever did see. I smile a little at that. 
I'll see what I can do. Uh, but I think first step is probably me finding Ed. So if you'll excuse me. Yeah. Um, before you go, uh, I think I think there's something else you should know. There's. She leans forward and whispers conspiratorially to you so that no one else in the kitchen beyond could hear. There's supposed to be tunnels underneath the house. It's just a rumor. I've never, I've never really found them myself. They were supposed to be here from when, when the Cherokee owned this land. And I, I, I've heard that there's an entrance in the study. Um, when everyone's distracted with the wedding, I'm, I'm going to go look in. Cassie would do the same for me. All right. Well, we may meet up there then. Sounds good. Thank you. Absolutely. What was your name? I'm Silas. Thank you, Silas. Adam? <laughs> I think while this is all going on, after I've signed the book and the servant has presumably given me a dirty look and moved on, uh, I'm, I'm awkwardly engaging fielding and conversation. Uh, you know, once, once it's just kind of the, <laughs> the three of us still left in, in the, what would it be? Foyer? Atrium? Whatever. Hall? Uh, I, uh, we grant it to Uh, I turn to, to fielding and say, well, long time no see. Long time indeed. Yeah, how have you? How have you been? It. It's been. It, well, it's been uh, far too long. Uh, it's a real pleasure. I can't think the last time you, me, and, uh, and BB were all in the same room. Can you? No, can't. I don't tend to spend my time in rooms generally. <laughs> I know this about you. Yes. Mm. Too true. But it is nice to be here with y'all. It's a rare treat. This is a beautiful day. A beautiful day. A beautiful day. Uh, my daddy, uh, the mayor, you might know him, he would always say there is nothing sadder in this world than a, a man with potential with a woman who don't see it. My mother, uh, his third wife, well, she agreed. <laughs> While the two of you are talking, I have gotten the look on my face like I've tried to eat a crab apple. Uh, <laughs> and uh, after a beat of silence I'll respond well, it's some kind of day that's for sure some kind of day most days are uh, do you have uh, reservations I take it well other than Lizzie I don't too much care for the gallows don't too much care for them Really? That is, that is, that is, that is, that is shocking. I I give you the slant-eyedest look I can possibly <laughs> manage. Say, now, Fielding, we hadn't been in touch for too long, but you know me. Is it that surprising, really? Well, well, I suppose shocking, but not perhaps surprising, now that you mention it. I think oh, you ought to bury that hatchet, though. These are these are people who are powerful and getting more powerful every day. You should make your peace more than peace. You should make your your connections. Fielding, a buried hatchet's no good to no one. You got to have it on your belt or in your hand for it to be useful. Why would you bury a hatchet? Well, so you can go find it when uh, when no one expects, <laughs> if you will. I give you a look like I'm trying to solve a magic eye puzzle, which of course doesn't <laughs> exist yet. <laughs> I look to BB uh, for confirmation that this was a very good joke on my part. <laughs> uh, I, I laugh, uh, you know, not quite uh, condescendingly. It's a, it's a warm, you know, kind of a reassuring laughter. Um, yeah, well, you know it. Um, yeah, well, so... Speaking of which, um, I don't know about you all, but I feel like we should go uh, announce ourselves to our hosts and um, thank them for the pleasure of being here. I cross my arms over my chest. 
I don't think my hosts much want to see me. I think I'm going to make myself scarce till the wedding or until I get a chance to talk to Lizzie. You see her, let well, me know. Very diplomatic of you. I thought you might <laughs> jump at the chance. <laughs> Diplomacy always been your specialty, Ed. I'll let Lizzie know if I see her that you are you are around and about. Let me know, Robin, if and when I show back up in the course of this. I think this would be about the time. Um, like the span of conversation right here yeah. likely took as long as your whole exchange okay. with Amelia and delivering the rings. Cool. Uh, I, I come back into the foyer uh, looking worried and like I've had tried to have three thoughts all at once. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Very too many. <laughs> At least two and a half too many. Yeah. Uh, Should I call a doctor? <laughs> <laughs> I, I point at BB, but I address Ed. Uh, could uh, it's possible I could use your assistance with a matter? What is it, Silas? Help you if I can. Uh I draw the two of them, fielding you are welcome to eavesdrop, <laughs> but in, or do whatsoever the fuck you please. I am eavesdrops. I am eavesdropping shamelessly, but uh, yeah. ah. also waiting to be invited, of course. I weren't dropping to leaves, Mr. Frodo. <laughs> <laughs> this is the crossover I was not expecting. <laughs> Scribble down in my notebook, Appalachian <laughs> Hobbits. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I picture uh, the Shire. Yeah, pretty they much. Were all yeah. of them deceived. <laughs> 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 For a third ring was brought to the wedding this day. <laughs> mm, the nameless things that dwell beneath the mountains. <laughs> I mean, that's a point of connection. Am I wrong? Yeah, there's definitely a Balrog under there. <laughs> <laughs> they dug too deep. The mines mm. of Moria. They did they, an alternate <laughs> Appalachia. In fact, that's exactly how well, all this happened. Exactly. They yeah, dug yeah, too yeah. deep. Uh, one of the servants was having a rough go of it. Thinks that uh, Amelia looked to either of you for recognition. Uh, assuming none, I sort of stumble over myself and barrel on uh thinks her her friend cassie was supposed to be here helping with cake uh sounded kind of sweet on her uh but uh she's been she she went missing and she's been hearing screams uh and she mentioned tunnels underneath the house. Ah, uh, and this this seemed like, well, sort of the intersection of your provinces. Hmm. No idea whether or not Silas should know that word. We're going to run with it. <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe even just misusing it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Silas, how long ago did this uh, young lady disappear? I will supply whatever the stated information was that <laughs> Des did not retain. <laughs> Robin, if you want to make me roll for this, did Silas? That would be that would be mean, <laughs> but appropriate. I could, but I'm not going to be that mean. Um, <laughs> I'm your hip, cool, friendly GM. You know? <laughs> Uh, it was, uh, according to her, it was a couple of weeks ago. She didn't specify an exact date, um, just that it was some time ago, and that everyone claimed that she, Cassie, left overnight to go to Hotchkiss, which is a nearby town. So there you have it. A couple of weeks ago, purportedly packed up her things and left in the middle of the night. Amelia is convinced otherwise. Mm -hmm. Couple of weeks, and... She's been hearing screams every night since then? This is what she told me. Well, that bodes <sighs> well for a wedding, don't it? Don't adjust. Fielding. True. Yes. Um, 
Upon Silas mentioning the tunnels, that probably sparks something that you're familiar with as someone who has a connection with the gallows and has been in this area a bit longer. Mm. Um, you've heard this rumor too, but it, it's essentially superstition. Uh, you don't think that, based on everything you've heard, you're not convinced of the legit legitimacy of there being tunnels. Um You've heard the same thing that Amelia kind of repeated is that the, the tunnels have been there since the Cherokee on the land. And frankly, you're in the middle of the mountain range. There's tunnels and caves under most places. I, I do, in fact, scoff. And I say, sure, sure, there are tunnels that have been here since since before white people settled. And there, George Washington was a mason. All of that. Sure, 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 sure. <laughs> I fix you with an extremely deadpan look and ask you saying there ain't no tunnels nowhere i'm certainly not saying that george washington ain't a mason <laughs> uh. i gaze at you for another moment with the kind of scorn that can strip meat from bones and then turn back to silas and say we looking to look for this lass? Uh, that's what she asked me to do. Said the pointed look at Fielding for those who can't see <laughs> uh, my out of character look gen generically at my webcam. Uh, and I will lean closer to Ed. Said there was an entrance in the study and she'd be trying to go down in during during the distraction of the wedding. Well, I ain't eager to miss the wedding, but folks need help, they need help. Well, I'll tell you what. I agree that we can't just close our ears and hope that nothing's going on. That's uh, all well and good where there's bumps in the night outside your house and all folks with sense stay put. But, uh, we're here. We've got to do something. I think, though, that it would be suspicious if we all checked in and then went missing before introducing ourselves. I say that we, uh, with the exception of Ed, for obvious reasons, uh, go pay our respects to, uh, the families of the bride and groom, uh, do a quick, uh, look around the place, uh, all casual like to, just kind of be seen milling about and then um, make our way with all due haste to the study. Well, of course. I need to deliver this gift. I draw attention to a bottle that maybe folks didn't notice with a card <laughs> attached to it. And I do, do, I do need to pay my respects to Father Gallows, of course, but then I will indulge you in your ludicrous notion of secret <laughs> tunnels just to see the look on your faces when we find out that there are no such things here or anywhere. Point of clarification, Robin. Uh, the Gallows brother that uh, came to tell me not to come, that was, was Saul Gallows? Mm -hmm. That is Saul Gallows, the elder mm -hmm. brother mm -hmm. of Good Lizzie. deal, good deal. Uh, so, uh, I'll reply, well, I gotta have a word with Lizzie if I got a chance, but uh, don't, don't much need to check in with the, the brothers, especially Saul. So, uh, probably waiting in the study when y'all are ready. If, uh, anybody wants to let me know when Lizzie's available, I don't, I don't want to throw a wrench in the works or nothing, but I, I, I gotta talk to Lizzie real quick. Are you making your way to the, the study? Uh, not uh, instantly, because, uh, this is this is basically me trying to wait around until I'm sure that I'm not going to be probably not the word that Ed would use, but interdicted <laughs> on my way to talk to Lizzie. <laughs> basically, I'm trying to trying to get a word in edgewise with the bride uh, without her family stopping me. <laughs> uh, and I'd like to make my way towards the uh, the families to uh, say my hellos, and I'd like to have a a word with Laura Lynn Ward uh, in particular. I'm sticking with Ed, even if it's awkward. <laughs> Especially when it's awkward. I do need perfect. to drop off this gift. That's my first order of business. Okay. I don't want to be hauling this thing around all night. 
So, uh, Nick and Drew, um, looking around the entryway, it's pretty obvious to you that they have divided the two staircases and the suites that they enter based on the wedding party. Um, do you have a preference for which staircase you're taking to try to connect with the family? Hmm. Oh, for you, it's easy. I think, think the, gallows the gallows side. The gallows side for me, yeah. Ward side for me. Yeah, gallows side. Okay. So that's going to be... Okay. They're... Honestly, because of you're looking for uh, Laura Lynn, um, mm-hmm. she's going to be on the ladies side. So you're both heading up the... I'm trying to remember which staircase I said in the intro. I think the left was the bride's side. If I remember left was the bride's side. I trust you on that. Um, so you're heading up the left staircase. Mm. Right, right, right. Just on a hunch. Maybe the servant told you earlier. We'll, we'll see. Um, you head up there. The There is, of course, like the symbolic flower barrier on the walkway connecting the two to show that both the bride and groom are pious leading up to their wedding. Um, you head down the hall and it's a fairly sizable suite. There's enough room for um, everyone to have space to spread out if they so choose. But on this special day, thankfully, they're just all in the sitting room. Um, Lizzie is kind of, or who you'd assume to be Lizzie. Do you know her? Do I know Lizzie? I've probably seen Lizzie. Okay. Yeah. So Lizzie yeah. is off on her own. Um, by the window, kind of staring out into the yard. Hmm. Uh, Laurelyn and Mal Gallows are are both playing cards to kind of pass the time. Um, it looks like they're well and ready for the wedding. They've already put on their fine dresses. Um, their their rouge and kind of rudimentary makeup is complete. Their hair is pristine. It's just a matter of waiting for all of the preparations taking place in the yard. I've probably gone up the left staircase as well, but I'm hanging back a little bit of the hallway so that I'm not, like, with these gentlemen, but I'll be, like, kind of next to the line. Perfect. Uh, I'll pay my respects to uh, just about everyone in the room. Um, We can skip past the particulars of that because it's just, (laughs) you know, it's warm, it's flattering. Uh, I turn the charm on if I can. Uh, when I go around to uh, Laura Lynn, I'd just like to, um, you know, again, kind of express my uh, joy um, at your family's joinings. And uh, thank you so much for the invitation. It's really spectacular to uh, see what's going on here. And, um, you know, I'd, I'd like to just kind of take in the sights, if you catch my meaning, and um, just um, see what I can do. If this is a private moment, then I just might say that, you know, I'm look into the things that usually aren't seen and uh if you'd be willing to cover for me if needed that would be uh i'd be much obliged <laughs> sure i can help with that it's not my place so i don't know how much help i'll be laura lynn's the type of person in her dress that looks intensely uncomfortable with the choice <laughs> of garment she keeps adjusting her skirts the shoes somehow don't seem to fit and she keeps shifting you're more used to seeing her in trousers. She looks about out of place in that dress as Ed would look. <laughs> but for today, at least, she's dolled up. She has a sour look on her face. And when you are speaking, she'll occasionally cast a glance in Lizzie's direction. <laughs> yeah, well, um, you try to enjoy yourself, Laura Lynn. Uh, you know, you look spectacular. Um, just... Be yourself and uh, see if you can find some joy in the day. I'll do my best. I excuse myself. Yeah, I greet everyone. I pay respects. I uh, I laugh, I think, convincingly at what I assume are jokes. Mm-hmm. Um, and is there an obvious place to leave gifts or, or do I should I hand it directly to... The bride, the mother of the bride, perhaps? Um, Val Gallows accepts it. As she sees you and immediately darts to her feet, brushes off her skirts, makes sure they're in order, and gives you a very gracious curtsy. An absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for including me in this this happiest of days. I, uh, I open up the card attached to the bottle and read it to her, <laughs> and it says, uh, quote, 
Who would drink whiskey if wine were cheap enough? Thomas Jefferson, Democratic Republican. Mm. Well, do you know they burn the casks now? Me. Mon Gallows looks a little bit confused, but she laughs. It's a very polite, rehearsed laugh that somehow still feels genuine and warm. That's almost strange to me, but uh, but I but I, I I thank her once again, and I say I, I really really could not be more pleased to be a part of this. Uh, how, how are you on this day? I hope you are having the wonderful wonderful time that you richly deserve. It's a wonderful day. It's not every day that you get to see your daughter in a happy marriage. And she looks over her shoulder at Lizzie pointedly, <laughs> still smiling, her face still cherubic uh, countenance and its warmth. Um, but there seems to be some sort of conflict or conversation that had occurred well before you arrived, but had resulted in an uncomfortable silence that you've broken. <laughs> now, 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 far be it from me to suggest that anything could possibly be amiss on so blessed a day as this, but is there anything perhaps that I could, well, do for you? Would you mind, and perhaps your friend too, checking on, checking on my ma? She's supposed to already be down, but I think the servants are just overwhelmed with everything. and They haven't gotten her dressed, and I just... I'm too focused on Lizzie today. I need to make sure she's presentable. It is such a shame when something so important as that slips on a day such as today. Of course, I would be obliged and honored to check upon your mother. Mel Gallows gives you directions, pointing up another staircase. Essentially, she's sending you to a, what would be termed a, a widow's watch. Mm. Um, it's the uppermost room, um, perhaps the hottest, especially on a summer day like this, but it seems to be where Mima is happiest. I, uh, I walk over to uh, to BB and say, I think uh, we've got a rather important uh, task. If we can delay our search for non-existent tunnels just a bit, it seems Mima's in need. Would you mind accompanying me? Sure, of course, uh, Mr. Gladwell. Um, let's uh, make it quick if we can, though. Of course, of course. We wouldn't want to impose. Ed, what are you doing this, during this time? Mostly waiting in the hallway for them to be done so that I can go in after them. <laughs> okay. I just wanted to give you the opportunity yeah. to slip in, talk to Lizzie while they were still there, if that was what your character wanted. I I, I probably am not trying to, to slip in so much as, as wait for them to, to, to get their niceties out of the way and then go, go talk to Lizzie. Uh it probably doesn't occur to me that this will make it more obvious that I am ignoring the other women in the room. <laughs> mm-hmm. So. Well, no. if all else fails, you've got me standing awkwardly beside you to uh, make everything <laughs> more awkward, but not have you at the center of it. Yeah. Perfect. Do you two speak <laughs> during this time? I... Or are you just standing awkwardly in silence? Oh, yeah, no, I'm shuffling your shoes i probably it doesn't occur to me to try to make conversation with silas uh other than to sort of give a an affirming nod in your direction (laughs) uh yeah no like bed don't don't want to talk like that's fine yeah i picture us leaning against opposite sides of the hallway uh perfectly comfortable in our discomfort (laughs) <laughs> one of us is aware of this discomfort <laughs> <laughs> absolutely perfect so nick and drew i take it that you head upstairs we do we head toward the widow's walk we will come back to you in a moment bom, bom, bom. <laughs> ed uh yeah. this is your opportunity Sure. I seeing them leave, I stride into uh, the room they just came out of, and I nod with what I assume is polite dignity uh, to everyone in the room other than Lizzie and approach Lizzie directly. Uh, she was sitting near the window looking out of the yard, correct? Mm-hmm. So I'm going to actually go down on one knee next to her. 
uh, and pull out from a particular pouch uh, a uh, lacquered hawk skull uh, and proffer it to her and say, Hey, Lizzie, how you doing? It's like you read the textbook on how to woo my ancestors. <laughs> 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 so, uh, backing up a bit, uh, Malgalas does give you a smile as you enter. You mm-hmm. know, it's a bit more forced than her previous smile, but she knows that if she doesn't try to pursue any conversation past that. Um, but when you get down on one knee, you pull out the, the lacquered <laughs> skull. <laughs> Lizzie th- seems to like snap out of her reverie and she mm-hmm. looks at you. Uh, she is much more fair in complexion mm. uh, than the rest of the gallows. Fair pair and eyes. She has a heart-shaped face. Um, but today, that natural beauty that she's kind of famed for locally is dimmed. Mm. Um, she has glassy, bloodshot eyes. It, it looks like she's been crying, too. It's an epidemic on this otherwise most happy of days. <laughs> Uh, but as soon as she sees you, she kind of ignores a lacquered hulk skull and throws her arms around your shoulders, um, expressing, oh, I'm so glad you came. I awkwardly sort of pat her back with the hand that's not holding the hawk skull and keep the, the hawk skull kind of like in whatever space is available between us. Uh, <laughs> and uh, sort of you know, I, pat I it a couple of times. I hand out to hold the hawk skull if you need it. I do not notice, but uh, if I did notice, I would be appreciative, but I don't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just enjoy that you just silently moved into the room. Yeah, yeah. Just <laughs> oh no, I've nodded at everyone yeah. and, you know, yeah. to the uh, degree that any of them know me, they probably know I don't talk much. Yeah, mm-hmm. and uh, so I'll respond, also, I'll respond to Lizzie with well, once I found out about it, I wouldn't have missed it for the world. Uh, probably I have a little awkward, untested term of endearment for her. Uh, let's say duckling. I call her duckling. <laughs> and that brings just the, the faintest touch of color to her face. <laughs> and she she looks away, looks back outside at the servants milling around. Mm-hmm. One of them is... Seems to be animatedly chasing a snake <laughs> <laughs> out of the courtyard <laughs> into, back into the woods surrounding. <laughs> uh, and she glances back at you and sighs, looks down, looks back up. And says, have, you, have you met him yet? Does, does he seem nice? Uh, I can't say I have. The only reason I, I knew you were having such a celebration is because Saul told me not to come so I knew I had to show up <laughs> that darn Saul I'm going to box his ears in the first chance I get I tell you what she she catches herself and then lowers her voice back into mm-hmm. a more appropriate tone <laughs> with a quick glance in her mother's direction and more pointedly Laura Lynn's direction <laughs> who quietly scoffs but otherwise pretends like she's not hearing it mm-hmm. You, I, I'm happy for you and all, but I just I want to make sure you're all right. I, I, it's been a minute, I think, since we we were able to to talk. And well, I, I'm happy for you, but it, it seems sudden to me way out in the woods. You you happy about all this? I feel like I should be happier. Like I knew this day was coming, but it, it still feels so sudden, especially especially when we're seeing you. With the wards, I wasn't expecting to go live with a family of miners. I give her an exaggeratedly serious look that I try to make sure no one else can see, and I lean close and I murmur, You need me to get you out of here? You just say the word, Dudley. I appreciate it, but I, I don't think I can do that. Imagine the scandal and my poor family. I, so much. Paul says so much is riding on this, and I don't want to let him down. I I shake my head a little bit with a light scoff and say, "Well, I don't pre- pretend to understand the goings on of my betters, but well, I know it matters to you, but scandal don't matter to me none. Helping." Helping those relying on me matters. So, all you ever need to do is call on me. 
And if you don't, I'll be trying to help you have the happiest day you can. Thank you. I appreciate that. So many people have been focused more on making sure the wedding goes off without a hitch that they kind of forgot to check in with me about the whole thing. I nod grimly. Yeah, it sounds about right. Well, you know you got a friend in the holler if you ever need it. And I proffer the lacquered hawk skull to her again a little bit more more forcefully. I say, don't know if this will help so much, but at the very least, help you think of me maybe when you need it. I I helped you out a little once. I can help you out more in the future. All all you got to do is say the word. But I ain't I ain't can do nothing if you don't call on me. You do. Uh, it's um, it's lovely. I, she takes it. <laughs> she she kind of puts a hand to her chest too, mm-hmm. with like a delighted gasp. Even though her brows for <laughs> she's not quite sure what she's looking at. Like it's it's a big bird, and she's got that much. But mm. anything past that, she can't quite tell. But she looks back up to you with sincere gratitude. Says, "I'll I'll reach out, but." I have heard that Samuel, you know, he's he's a fine gentleman. He's an upstanding, soft-spoken, God-fearing man. I, I couldn't really help, hope for more. I grin at her in a, an only slightly forced way and say, I find all the best men are soft-spoken. <laughs> she laughs in earnest at that. Um, <laughs> a rare cackle uh, <laughs> escaping rather than the bell-like laughter that you're you're used to. I uh, take her one of her hands in both of mine and squeeze it briefly before letting it go and say, well, I ain't going to take you away from all the festivities, but, well, you or Samuel need help. That's that's the thing I'm here for. I'm not good at all the niceties, but when it comes down to brass tacks, you got me. You, you promise you'll be sit where somewhere I can see you from the altar? We'll do, Duckman. We'll do. I, I think I'll feel a lot better if I know that, you know. I feel a lot better knowing that you're here. I'm so glad you didn't listen to my sour turd of an older brother. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I do laugh at that, though softly as I can manage. Uh, and I smile at her and I say, he couldn't have worked out a better invitation than telling me not to come, Duckman. Ain't that the truth? <laughs> I I stand up and I give her my best version of what I think a courtly bow might look like, uh, hmm. and uh, and say, "Don't want to displease no one else, but well, I'm here. Come find me if you need me." And do a little bit more natural of like a, a wave and a bow, and then go to leave without speaking to anybody else if I can get away with it. <laughs> she, as you walk away, she takes the lacquered skull consideringly <laughs> in her hands and smiles softly to herself, looking a little bit more stable and resolved than when you first entered. Right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the Kermit flow is already occurring. <laughs> Excellent. Um, <laughs> Nick and mm. Drew. Mm-hmm. Actually, um, Silas, did, were you taking care of anything while in the room or just continuing just to follow it? standing with? awkwardly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Even perfect. more awkwardly, I, kind of following like a duckling, but we'll ignore that. <laughs> yeah, yeah oh, that's, that's adorable. That's an odd compliment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Black hat, golden retriever, we're good. <laughs> Great dynamic. <laughs> All right, Nick and Drew. So you're going mm. upstairs to Mima's room. Mm-hmm. It's a, a fairly narrow staircase, not as narrow as the servants' staircases, but it's clearly a place that's not really meant to be occupied um, in a sincere matter, or at least subject to the public view. It's surprising to you, Fielding, that they would let you see this portion of the house. Uh, usually when you visit, it's all grandeur, so perhaps it's a sign that they have grown to trust you. Or that you've somehow gained some estimation. At least that's what you like to think. 
In any case. Oh, I, oh, I think that. <laughs> no, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure it needed no prompting from me, too. But you you knock gently on the door at first, I assume, or do you go straight in? Oh, I knock gently. I say, uh, uh, Mima, uh, if, if we may be so, uh, so presumptuous as to enter, we're, uh, we're here to check upon your well-being. You hear a soft, paper-thin voice, almost barely imperceptible through the wood of the door, say, enter. I put my ear to the door as though I didn't hear it correctly, and don't know if I hear anything when I listen to the wood of the door, but then I gather the courage of my convictions and open it. This room is modestly appointed. It's clear that Mima has kind of set up camp up here. There's a bed, um, even though there's not intended to be a bed in the space, just a, a narrow twin uh, mattress on the ground. Um, her, it smells vaguely of cobwebs, stale air, and a little bit of old perfume, the latter of which you gather is wafting for Mima herself, who sits still wearing the black of a widow, even though her husband passed long ago gazing out the window, where she would be if the curtains weren't drawn closed. Her eyes are covered by a black lace fascinator, um, typical for the style of this period, and her skin is wrinkled and has that slightly translucent appearance like crepe paper. That uh, is pretty indicative of her age. Um, she just doesn't really notice you coming in or respond until you try to get her attention. I approach just a few paces. I still leave a distance between myself and her, and I say, uh, well, uh, I only wish, and I'm sure you do as well, that, that Pawpaw Gallows was, was here to see this. She snaps her head towards you. An audible crack of the neck. My hand had been on my watch chain. It jerks off, and <laughs> I have to stop myself from taking a defensive stance. Yeah. <laughs> You're close enough at this point that you can smell her breath when she talks. It's, it's sickly sweet, like blood and nectar. And she's, she starts muttering at you. So many eyes. So many mouths. Yes, Mima, there certainly are a lot of guests here. Uh, many to feed, but, uh, you know, it seems like the help's got it covered. Um, how are you doing? She raises her head, um, gives you a glimpse underneath the black veil covering her eyes. Her eyes are white and milky, with splashes of blue so cold that they remind you of a plunge into the river on a summer's day. And she leans forward, baring her yellow teeth, almost like a snarl, holding up a gnarled finger to her lips, and says, Listen. I listen. I do. <laughs> the candles in this room flicker even though you don't really feel a breeze. And something hits the window. A thud. Might be a bird. Doesn't break the glass, but the pain shakes with the force of it. I go to the window and I've, draw the curtains. I flinch cartoonishly <laughs> when whatever hits the window hits the window. When you draw the curtains, the sun's shining. The glass might be streaked with faint imprints, but on closer look, it's just the upper windows of the house. I can probably use a deep cleaning. <laughs> There's nothing there that you can see. Drew. Mima yes. takes your hand. It's too cold. Their arthritis in the joints make it feel like the rough burl of wood rather than anything that was ever soft or living for that matter. Mm. And she says, before dusk, blood calls its due. 
she pats your hand as though she just said the most comforting thing in the world. <laughs> I try to fix my face as though to receive it as such. Uh, does anything stir within me, though, when she says this? Yes. <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> Do you care to mention what you uh, might experience <laughs> stir inside of you? Well... Well, and it's it's not really anything. I'm sure. I'm sure it's true of many local politicians. But there's a shadow inside me. Uh, it speaks to me. It feeds on me. It protects me from whatever it is that's feeding on me. So maybe there are many shadows inside me. Warring there are two shadows inside of you. A minimum thereof. They're like <laughs> wolves. They're not wolf shaped, actually, as far as I can tell. But when they stir, it's not good. It's when I do my best work as an orator, of course, but. It's not necessarily a thing one wants to experience, and it usually portends something, well, something. <laughs> Mima also seems to experience something. Her eyes briefly gain a bit of clarity, and the bearing of her yellow teeth becomes more of a rictus grin. And as she locks eyes with you, more thuds, this time on the roof. Shortly followed by another and another. And now it sounds closer to thick raindrops, filling the space with a dull roar. It's the only sound in the room for an uncomfortable moment. I clasp her hand not so tightly as to hurt her, but I do not wish to allow her to let me go as the sound continues. Nick, do you have a reaction? Uh, I lean closer to the window, trying to see if I can get a line of sight on anything above us, but I assume that the angle's not quite right. Unfortunately not. But I'm still going to have you roll. Yay! Because here's the thing about the, the way the window is located. You kind of have to lean yourself up and into the sill and there's a little stand by the window that's in the way so this will be a might goal i'm not going to tell you the difficulty i rolled a nine all right you're that was a success you you managed not to topple over this little side table that was more rickety than you thought um, when you were first leaning up to get the view but uh, you notice that a notebook is preparing to slip off of it and manage to capture it before it falls along with a little lamp that has been set there, oil burning, um, and prevent things from falling to the ground. You can't see anything hitting the roof, but as the sound starts to abate, Mima starts to laugh. You sound a bit like creaking wood. Hmm. Uh, I start laughing uh, too without thinking. <laughs> this is all just super real. Uh, 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 I'd uh, like uh, to surreptitiously pocket the notebook. Good call. Uh, that is as you have guessed Granny's notebook. Or Mima's notebook in this case. So <laughs> having acquired the cipher, I'll need you to roll a d6. Okay. Six. Okay, so the level will be nine. But pocketing it, you feel a bunch of tabs or dog-eared pages, and you realize that this was Mima's kind of personal, not her, you think it might be a diary, but it's something that she clearly has opened and closed many times or folded pages over. I'll uh, give you more description when you have a chance to look at it later. Okay. But you're up here with me, Amal. The thudding has ceased. There's no sound of what caused it. Her laughter fades, and it appears like she's already dressed, if not uh, criminally creepy. Mm-hmm. Okay. Adam. Yeah, was this um, thudding sound audible outside of the, the widow's watch? Oh, I'm assuming not. Uh, I thought you're a story down. Okay. So I don't think it was 
particularly audible. Awesome. I'm super glad to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, the sound of rain on a sunny day is always uh, mm -hmm. a bit of an alarming thing. Just checking. Not ideal. Is there anything that the thing inside me is compelling me to say or do as I hold Mima's hand? Keep holding her hand. I do that. Without question, hesitation, or any expectation that I will ever be doing anything else. <laughs> yeah, she took your hand. And now it's taken. Mm -hmm. All right, so anything you need, me, Ma? Shall I send you up a glass of water? That would be nice, dearie. All right, then. You just hang tight. So uh, yeah, then I head back down. Is there, as far as I can tell, any possibility that I could release her hand? Or is that still impossible? You could. She seems to have reverted back to how you found her. The sort of, I don't want to say catatonic state, but she's out of it again. She's, she's checked out. She's no longer lucid. Vacant. Vacant's a great word for it. Now, you take care and know that we will always take care of you. I pat her hand with one of my hands. She, her head kind of tilts in your direction, but not fully. As though she can see a shape of you, but isn't actually looking at you. And her eyes, though largely sightless, drift behind your shoulder. Slowly and gently, I release her hand and start to get up. You don't look behind you? I definitely do look behind me. <laughs> There's nothing there. <laughs> that you can see. That you can see. <laughs> yeah. Is anything screaming at me about what I can't see? <laughs> no, you just feel seen. Mm-hmm. So terribly, terribly seen. Yeah, I begin making my way out of the room. I look in every direction as I do, unselfconsciously, um, but also terribly self-consciously. Uh, <laughs> I look in directions that I'm not sure I have names for. <laughs> Nick, are you tacking along with him? Yes, if I haven't already exited the room, then seeing his gaze, I'd look around the room as well. But if I also see nothing... Then I will exit the room and lay my eyes on that little notebook that I uh, borrowed. Yeah. You don't see anything. I will say you felt something with the sound. I should have covered this earlier, but you felt mm. a degree of familiarity. Mm. Kind of like when you smell perfume that you violently associate with someone, but can't recall who they are. Mm-hmm. Mm. Both yeah. of you head back downstairs. Do you reconnect with the other two and below? It, it feels like this is probably about the time I'd be exiting uh, Lizzie's room. Mm -hmm. I do let Ma Gallows know that Mima could use a glass of water. <laughs> uh, she nods to you, smiles, that big, bright, beaming smile again, and expresses her gratitude for checking on Mima. I say it very much in the same tone as, what if we clean the ocean? <laughs> <laughs> oh, nicely done. <laughs> so, um, it seems like just based on the stir of activity that you can hear in the house below, things are starting to accelerate. You can hear more guests down below. Uh, what do you guys do next? And Cal. <laughs> So, if we are meeting back up in the hallway here, we'll move, I'll move us, I'll try to move us at least towards the staircase and then sort of mutter in an audible but low voice, well, I'm supposed to be in the seating where Lizzie can see me for the service, but if we can check on the study before then, I don't have a problem with that. Yes. Uh, I think we should. 
To my mind, let's get this study business over with. We'll see that there's no staircase to a secret tunnel, there's no goblins or ghouls, and we'll move on and enjoy our evening. Field's insistence that there are no secret <laughs> passages make me think that there's definitely secret passages in Mr. Gladwell's home. I... <laughs> <laughs> I regard fielding levelly and say, looking at a goblin right now, as far as I can see. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, that's very droll. I, I aim to be droll, Mr. Cladwell. In the meantime, I am moving towards the... Uh, front door so that I can grab my weapon to head to the study. <laughs> I am not att not attempting to be surreptitious or anything about it. That same servant is still positioned by the front door with the guest book. They're, mm -hmm. they're helping some other guests get checked in and, and sign the registry, but as they see you approach, they just glare at you openly and then make the decision to ignore you. I answer the glare with an extremely toothy smile until they direct their attention elsewhere, at which point I barely stop myself from sticking out my tongue. Probably reads on my expression if anybody's looking. <laughs> the, the two guests with whom they're conversing appears to be <laughs> husband and wife. Their smiles freeze <laughs> as they notice that exchange unfold, but they're too polite to draw attention to it. My kind of people. <laughs> I will nod absently to them because that's apparently what one does to people. Mm -hmm. In short order, I have slung my strung bow across my shoulder, put my hatchet through a loop, and put my uh, hunting knife through its sheath, uh, and put my quiver on my hip. Uh, it probably takes me 15 seconds all told, and then I pivot back into the uh, entryway and give a decisive nod to the others. Oh, I have had to go heft my hammer, which honestly looks so much a part of me that, like, of course the blacksmith's got his hammer. Mm -hmm. Makes sense to me. Seeing no resistance to any of this, I grab my flintlock pistol as well. Do I wipe it off with the cloth I'd placed it on, as though other people <laughs> might have been touching it. <laughs> I love this because, kind of definitionally, the barrel and, and action of your flintlock is made of iron, <laughs> and you're just like treating it like it's silver. Perfect. <laughs> Absolutely perfection. No notes. That's beautiful. So I take it you head back to the study. Yeah. I don't know if I know where the study is, but I pretend that I do, unless somebody else is more confident than me, in which case I follow them. Would I know where the study is? Yeah. Have I been over here enough times? Oh, yeah. Uh, it's one of uh, Paul Gallows' favorite places to entertain you. With an uncontained flourish, I lead to the study. <laughs> I tell stories of other times I've uh, <laughs> been here. And... You've likely smoked a fair few cigars upon this study. I describe the cigars in detail. I stare ten miles into the distance <laughs> during this whole exchange <laughs> while I follow fielding. <laughs> so the four of you enter the study. Uh, who goes through the door first? Definitely me. Definitely. <laughs> well, you enter the door. Um, so. Nice, richly appointed study. Uh, this is more of what you've come to expect from the gallows, and that there are signs of affluence and wealth on display. A few mounts from hunting, like a deer, a deer head in the corner. It's a tin pointer. Paul's especially proud of it. <laughs> There's books, a small bar, cigars. A chess table that's currently cleared for an unfinished game of cards, some of which almost look like they've been drawn on. Um, and a few bookshelves and a horsehair seat that is currently occupied by Paul Gallows himself. Mm. Paul does not have the height of the rest of his family. But that clearly is the result of Paul Gallows' side, the Teasley family from which she hails. 
He's uh, short and sturdy. Um, his lo- his face is deeply creased with laugh lines and gives him a permanently jovial expression. Uh, his cheeks and nose are perpetually wind burnt. They have that sort of cherry affect um, that's common, especially in farmers and people who spent a lot of their life toiling over fields. And as you walk in, his eyes light up. He finishes taking a puff from his cigar, no doubt of his own tobacco, and lets forth a deep, booming laugh and says, Oh, Fieldling, it's so good to see you today. A great pleasure, a great pleasure, Mr. Gallus. I would not presume to call you Pa on most days, but today, today that is the foremost of your roles in this here world. Congratulations. My no, eyeballs are vibrating with the effort of not rolling. <laughs> <laughs> pa actually looks at you and offers the same smile. Mm. Um, this one doesn't seem forced in the way that Ma is, and... It's pretty apparent that whatever beef is between you uh, and the elder brother has not reached his ears. I, um, at somewhat taken aback, offer a tentative smile, sincere but unsure. He uh, seems somehow to even brighten more at that. Like At this point, it might be positively difficult to stare at his beaming face. <laughs> For me, but certainly. But he turns... He turns his attention back to Fielding and says, Today I am the proudest of Paws. It's not every day you get to marry off your daughter to such a fine gentleman. He is so bold that he holds his arms wide and a clear expression of wanting to give you a hug. I answer it uh, unhesitatingly. I say, Indeed, a fine gentleman, a fine marriage. She seems effervescent. <laughs> <laughs> I think you almost caused Adam to do a spit take. <laughs> oh, what a word. That was what, a fantastic what, what? word. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, Paul's spine straightens at this. Uh, even though he's stout, he manages to take on the affect of a much taller man, and another booming laugh echoes through the study. Well, Mr. Gallows, it is such a pleasure to see you on this fine day. Just the man I was looking for. I was hoping to perhaps sneak a cigar in um, before the ceremony gets started. But uh, alas, I was just talking to, uh, you know, Lizzie, and it seems like she could maybe use a bit of a cheering up. Um, So I I don't want to detain you, um, unless, of course, you've got time. Oh, I've got nothing but time, and your company would be nice in selling my nerves. I know Lizzie has all the ladies. It's important that... The gentleman not go into the bridal suite. You know that's bad. <laughs> well, of course, I was just uh, wondering whether perhaps something could be arranged. But uh, you're right, you're right. On this special day, you should just uh, kick back and uh, relax and let things go as they may. He gives you a conspiratorial look before opening his the jacket of his suit and... It's almost like he has a few extra cigars holstered in there. <laughs> I'm not saying anything, but my expression is very much like I have wandered into a, a meeting I didn't know was happening of people that I'm not sure what their affiliation is. I'm just like trying to like puzzle things out and standing in the background. So you've gone full math lady meme. <laughs> <Yeah>. More or less. <laughs> All Great. before you is equations. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm just looking at you, Ed, like you're supposed to have the answers to this. And I am unaware of your gaze. <laughs> and Paul Gallows offers each of you a cigar if you would like to take one. It's it, They're not a safe. <laughs> yeah, I uh, pause. I, 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 I kind of anachronistically, I blue screen for about a half a second and then sort of automatically take the cigar. Uh, it's not like I've never had one before, but I've certainly never been offered one by Paul Gallows before. <laughs> I think I will thank him and decline. <laughs> I take mine as though it's a cipher. Rapturous, attentive, uh, utterly grateful. 
Mm. It makes you feel good. Mm. Point of order, Robin. Um, mm -hmm. Is this room someplace that I've been often before or not so much? It's You've been invited into it a, a fair few times. You're more familiar with the sort of more formal dining area mm -hmm. um, where they would mm -hmm. entertain you or the tea room. The study is usually Paul Gallo's domain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, brilliant. All right, so since I failed to get him out of the room uh, with a ruse, um, I would like to do something else sneaky. Okay. Uh, I would like to kind of go about the room animatedly talking um, instead of kind of sitting down as though I'm kind of carried away with myself, uh, kind of pontificating about how beautiful the home is and this study in particular is such, uh, you know, so beautifully appointed and such a comfortable kind of den for, um, you know, the, the men of the house. Um, just trying to read his expression as I look closely around the room at books, at objects, kind of drifting near the desk to see if there's any particular reaction of guardedness around any particular part of the room, um, trying to divine the location of a secret entrance if there is one in this uh, in this space. I feel like this is going to be a rule. I'm going to take advantage of this if I can, and wherever uh, BB is going, I'm going to be sort of like in the opposite direction, also looking a little bit more pointedly Ooh. at at the the scenery. <laughs> so we're kind of uh, uh, uncoordinatedly <laughs> but opportunistically sort of examining different parts of the room at the same time. Him with the attention on him, and me with the attention off of me. Well done, Ed. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> this is fantastic teamwork. Okay, <laughs> so now I'm going to need a roll from both of you. Uh, of course. Um, I'm going to, this is definitely going to be an intellect roll, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, unless you want to make a case for it being a speed roll and that uh, you're trying to do something quick without him noticing, but it seems like you're both gauging his reaction. It feels like mm -hmm. this is probably an intellect roll for me as well, yeah. Okay. Can I roll might to sort of be a visual obstacle as relevant? <laughs> um, so you're going to intentionally block where he's... I think intentionality, again, ascribes too much thinking. <laughs> uh, I think I will just sort of happen to be mm -hmm. between Pa and Ed. Well, and I was going to say, too, that I don't know, I, I guess I, I'm kind of sort of arguing for these to apply, but I have I, I have training in both tracking and mapping, and those are both sort of catty corner to what I'm doing now, but... Mostly we, my aim, to be clear, Robin, is to uh, assist Ed rather than mm -hmm. to, like, do anything directly affecting okay. myself. Um, oh, I see. So here's what you can do. Mm -hmm. I will, instead of having you roll might, if mm -hmm. you want to spend your action helping, that yeah. will ease this difficulty okay. by one. Okay. And I would recommend doing that. I'm not going to assign a number to this because I feel like that would be showing too much of my hand. Mm -hmm. um, but I would advise you do that instead of rolling for might. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the role for might was to see whether my help was effective. Okay. Sure. Yeah. sure you can but... always take an action to help and okay, reduce cool. the difficulty by one. Then yeah, I'll, I'll do that. So you're Are you like, helping Ed or BB? I'm assuming Ed. Ed? Yeah, yeah. Ed, help repay your debt. <laughs> Indeed. I, that on the one hand, on the other hand, one of these does not involve social interaction. <laughs> mm -hmm. This <laughs> or, is true. Or the attention of other people on me. Sure enough, and uh, I think I'm gonna also go ahead and apply some effort to this to ease it by another level uh for for three for my intellect pool okay. uh so i'll i'll bring that from 13 to 10 uh i because i don't have any edge in, in intellect mm -hmm. uh so this feels like a good time to explain Pools and edge. So I, I like the way that you explained it previously, Adam, when, before we were recording. 
um, in terms of pool being what is currently there and your stat being the maximum. Um, so you have an amount of points to spend in your pool. You can spend three points to expend effort, which eases the difficulty of the task by one. Um, the caveat here is that your pool also serves as your hit points. Uh, so once your three pools are depleted, that is essentially the state where you're probably dead. Uh, so they are a resource to, to spend, but do so wisely. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a good use. I'm glad to hear that. So my, my intellect pool is going for 13 to 10 to ease this by another level. So I think uh, overall that's two levels, one from uh, Silas's assistance and one from my effort. And I guess and if possibly I possibly a third, depending on the applicability of your track. Yeah, I guess if I if I can make the argument that tracking and or mapping apply, that could ease it by one more. <laughs> but um, that is up to you, so GM. Talk to me a little bit more about how you feel a tracking will help you in this case. What sure. exactly are you looking for? Tracking in this case, right, we're looking for a secret passage. So it'd be signs that people have passed through some area of this room that would otherwise seem impassable wear and tear footprints in carpet uh wear on wood floors or on uh plaster in the wall or something like that uh just looking for signs that there are places that you can exit this room that are not the door we came in through okay excellent so i have your target number okay mind. i'm gonna go ahead and roll yours as well nick so go ahead and roll for me See what happens. And while I they're rolled... rolling, Robin, do I get further progress, or is that just like <laughs> I'm helping ahead? You will get progress depending on the success of the. Sure, 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 sure. I, to be clear, I'm not really like chasing it down, but if presented with the opportunity for XP, like, I'm not gonna say no. Yeah, and I'll have to think on this too because I don't want to have. Helping as an action turn into yeah, XP no, I'm sure. I, I think that that that's sort of an at most once type thing, mm -hmm. or for big type things. Mm -hmm. Yes, but yeah, yeah. So my role was an eleven. You're successful. You gaze around the room. Not you kind of allow your notice to slip from paw, and you do see something. Nick, what was your result? I haven't rolled yet because I wanted the chance to say that I would also like to apply effort, um, which usually costs three points out of my intellect pool. But since I have an edge of one, I think that reduces it to two points spent. Mm -hmm. So now rolling, I rolled a 17. <laughs> As a rolling yeah, you're also <laughs> um, successful. So we'll resolve Adams first. Um, so as you're moving around, you notice that even though pains to keep the floor as pristine as possible have been taken, they missed a clod of dirt. It was directly in front of the bookshelf towards the back of the room. It's hard to tell if this remnant from a foot actually somehow passed through the bookshelf. For all you know, they could have just been standing there to admire the titles. Nick, you get a different reaction. As you're moving around, you check out a globe that is in the corner. Check out the bookshelves. And pa is just smiling the whole time, clearly elevated and enthusiastic about the praise of his space. And it's only when you pass by the chess table where there's the in-progress card game that you notice his eyes flick down and then back up to you. I do my best to just kind of continue the patter um, and not show anything on my face. Um, continue just kind of praising other kinds of spaces to um, put him at ease again. It doesn't take much. He's a pretty affable guy and he's clearly grateful for the company. All right. Well, um, guess my cigar is burning a bit low at this point. Um. You hear bells out in the courtyard at this point. You can only assume that's the sign for everyone to proceed to where the ceremony is going to take place. 
If I can, I'd like to catch BB's eye and sort of draw your attention to the bookcase that I suspect may contain the secret door. But I promised Lizzie that I would be sitting where she could see me. So if the bells are ringing, it's time for me to go fulfill my promise. Indeed. What are the rest of you doing? Are you heading out to the courtyard? I exit the room with Pa, um, but after ways down the hallway, um, I split off and say, I-, I promise I'll be right there. I just need to answer the call of nature first. Am I aware of this bookcase? Being <laughs> That's a great <laughs> question. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I was trying to signal BB, whether you picked up on it or not, I guess is a GM call. I, I'm ruling tragically for myself that I sure didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like for me it could go either way. Yeah, it might be a GM call. Uh, I'll let you roll for it. Okay. What am I rolling? Int? Uh, you're gonna roll intellect. Okay. Or maybe it, I'll mm. give you the choice of intellect or speed. Hmm. I'll go intellect. Okay. <laughs> I rolled a five. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're oblivious. <laughs> <laughs> Which, to be fair, is in character. <laughs> it is. It is. He probably thinks he's vindicated too. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm very pr- I'm puffed up right now. See, there were no secret passages in the study, you guys. <laughs> to an, uh, to a casual observer, I would look 3 inches taller. So <laughs> proud am I that there were no secret passages. So Des, I assume you're following along with Yeah. Gang? Yeah. Okay. I may try to also catch Silas's eye and, like, gesture you back to the study. <laughs> I will, as long as Pa is not looking at me, just sort of nod gruffly, dumbly, take your pick, and, like, walk slower even than normal. Sure. If I can hang back, I'll be like, bookcase in the whatever part of the study is applicable uh, and just try to sort of like point you in that direction since maybe you would be less missed at the ceremony than i would adam yes there's a lovely thing called a gm intrusion in this game sure there is (laughs) (laughs) you have the option should you have any of spending an xp point to note me but you do not (laughs) i don't have any xp so i can't do that And Paul Gallows, as proud as he is on his daughter's wedding day, mm-hmm. is not letting any of you out of his sight. That's he fair. is clinging to you for a sense of normalcy leading up to this big climatic moment for him. Mm-hmm. I will do my best to validate it, awkward as that may be. This <laughs> also includes... So... I'm so waiting. fucking normal. <laughs> I'm so <laughs> Yeah. I, I want to add that this also includes offering to wait for BB to answer nature's call <laughs> and then escorting <laughs> all of you personally out to the courtyard. Sure. The nice thing about GM interventions is that they're not just a tool for me to troll the usual GM with my power. Um, you actually get experience points. Mm. So... There, you will receive one, but you also receive another experience point that you can bestow upon one of your fellow player characters. I believe it is must, indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm going to bestow this point on Silas because we have been trying to communicate via eyeballs only for this whole time. And whether we're (laughs) successful or not, it feels like that is a good enough reason to bestow an XP on on Silas. (laughs) Much obliged. So both of you get one XP that you can add to your experience pool. And indeed I have. First of all, BB, do you actually step try to step away and put forth the semblance while the rest of the, the team waits for you? I do. I step away, try to put forth the semblance, um, and uh, as I find some privacy, I do look at the... Did you say that it's a cipher, uh, Mima's journal? Mm-hmm. 
I'd yes. just like to understand the general nature of what that might do if looked at in the right way. So you open it up and briefly flip through the pages. Um, it contains a lot of herbal instructions, um, what we would call granny magic, uh, tinctures for curing whatever ailments may affect someone. And it's especially geared towards healing, which surprises you. You never really knew Nemo. You didn't really know her to dabble in those type of arts, but it's something that you're familiar with. But you also notice that there's interesting exclusions here and there. Mm. Like blank spaces on the page. I see. And you do have that enabler that allows you to perceive creatures and objects that are normally invisible or hidden via magic. So you can tell that there is hidden ink on these pages. Mm -hmm. All right. Noted for later. I uh, finish with the business at hand and um, rejoined uh, Paul and uh, head out to the wedding. So it's a, a fairly modest affair that you emerge out onto, though it's modest in the way that it is trying to be humble. Uh, there are flowers uh, delicately arranged on each of the rows of seats. It's interesting to you. Actually, this is good for a roll. I'm not going to dictate this one. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, mm -hmm. um, as a resident sage, go ahead and roll intellect for me. Ooh, that is a three. <laughs> the flowers are lovely. <laughs> <laughs> You're impressed by the variety and colors of the arrangements. Clearly, someone in this family has a bit of a green thumb. And I mean that in a completely normal sense, not in the magical green. Uh -huh. That is the force at work in this universe. <laughs> not a the green thumb. <laughs> yeah, not the green thumb. Ah, green thumb. Very big distinction between the two. So you're ushered to your seats. Pa splits off from you uh, once a couple of the staff kind of swoop in to usher you to your seats. They're a little far back from the roped off seats for family. Mm -hmm. It's really hot outside, even at this relatively early hour. Do they do they react to the fact that, like, between us, there's a bow, a hatchet, and a sledgehammer? You get some looks. The fact that you showed up with Pa sets people naturally at ease. It's a boon in your <laughs> benefit. If you had shown up by yourself, I think you would have gotten a much different reaction. Perfectly fair. And there are servants that kind of give you a stink eye. I thoroughly ignore it. <laughs> yeah. With the heat kind of bearing down on you, the distant drone of cicadas, you get why the family opted to have the wedding at such a strange time. And it's my favorite stuff to have you guys roll, but I'm going to need a intellect roll from each of you as you look to the altar and where the wedding will actually occur. All right. 16. 14. 9. Natch. No, I know, two nines, a 14, and a 16? No, no, no. Natch, as in a 20. Ooh, okay. Damn. Well, that's going to be our first major effect. <laughs> <laughs> You're Let welcome, me Robin. best out this book. <laughs> Oh, and for my. me, of all people. <laughs> <laughs> the the one with the mm -hmm. uh, intellect challenges. So when you roll a natural 20, as the case should be, you don't just succeed. You get to have a major effect. So this will be our first major effect of the session. When you roll a natural 20 or even a 19, uh, you have the option to activate a minor effect or a major effect. 
And usually this is something that is beneficial to you in some way, shape, or form. Um, in this case, the major effect that you have is that there's been a mistake. One of the servants looks at you, looks up and down at you, and immediately gestures for you to sit closer with the family. <laughs> you don't realize this, but they've mistaken you for that fella fielding Cladwell, who was supposed to sit with the family. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Too perfect. I, the blacksmith, am fielding well-dressed. <laughs> <laughs> yes, fielding well-dressed. You gotta love the... <laughs> Dickensian naming going on, yes. Yes. Um, and as far as what you notice when you look towards the altar, it's a little bit of a strange arrangement. Because, yes, there's the usual rope for the binding of the hands. There's the Bible. But there was also a knife. Which strikes you <laughs> as odd. <laughs> and thanked Adam cracking up. Sorry, that really got Robin. me. <laughs> Robin? Yeah? Can I have made it? I'll allow it. You made it specifically for Paul. It's a mm -hmm. beautiful work of art, one you're very proud of. Its handle tip is meant to look like a raptor's claw, and you etch the blade with a tricolor depiction of the mountains. It's one of your best works. You thought it was a bit weird when he commissioned it, but here it is. On the altar on his daughter's wedding day. Perfect. Ed, you're obviously not familiar with the fact. No, <laughs> that, obviously. Uh, Silas made it, but you also observe the knife and the relative beauty of it. And I smile. Mm -hmm. If one of y'all has the connection to me of recognizing my work anywhere. I don't know that we established that, but. That's part of why I point this out now. Probably not me. Anyway. Yeah. We didn't establish that it was me, but it's not impossible. That could be sort of the reciprocal part of... Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I, I don't think your role was successful, so... <laughs> you did not notice the knife. Fair enough. You do not see the trap. <laughs> <laughs> I seem to be extremely good at not seeing the trap. Honestly, underrated. It's in skill. character. Yeah. So the band starts playing. You didn't notice them initially. And looking at them, you can tell this is not usually their fare. The banjo is a bit too twangy for the style of classical music that they're aspiring to play. They're clearly a bluegrass local band from the same holler that's been tasked with fancying up their stuff a bit for the special day. Trying to play Debussy. <laughs> sure <laughs> and in due time the procession itself begins I take it that everyone's settled into their seat Silas you're closer to the front the rest of you are further back likely much to the frustration of fielding <laughs> I am fuming Basically, my attitude is my eyes are locked on Lizzie whenever she is visible. And, and she's not yet. Yeah, just totally unfocused when she's not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the courtyard is at the back of the house, but looking around, you have the sense that it was selected so that they could throw open the wide doors leading out for the wedding procession. Is the groom up there waiting? Not yet. The first one to walk down the aisle is Father Atticus, the preacher. His outfit is freshly pressed and immaculate, and he walks to the front with all the practice gravitas of a preacher, hands neatly folded. He's just the very image of solemn piety. At the altar, he raises his palms up to the heavens, briefly casting a shadow over his eyes. And then he nods as if to himself and turns to face the aisle where the rest of the procession occurs. Mal Gallows is next, 
She's escorted to her seat by Paul Ward, but he doesn't. She doesn't look happy about it at all. Her arm is rigid, and you would recognize this as an effort to keep Paul at a respectable distance. <laughs> And you get the sense that he's not picking up the cues because at the end of the aisle, they part ways to take up their respective seats and she has to dodge his effort to kiss her hand <laughs> before settling in her seat, daintily pulling out a kerchief to gently pat at her forehead where small beads of sweat are forming. I give an understanding nod. Yeah, she doesn't seem to notice or at least don't think she does until you see her nod back without quite looking in your direction. And Pa Ward takes what he feels is a very discreet sip from his jacket. (laughs) (laughs) Samuel comes next. Chin set high. His he's visibly nervous. He's fiddling with his cufflinks, gripping his wrist. As he passes by each of you, you can hear his breathing quick and shaky. He's trembling. It's your first time seeing him. He's handsome in a way that miners often can be. He's someone who suits the dirt and soot that seems to cling to his skin well. He has long, dark hair, dark eyes, a very chiseled jawline, and prominent cheekbones. I do my best not to glare at him. Uh, this is the groom. Yeah. I do my best not okay, to Okay, you're him. doing your best not to glare. <laughs> gotcha. I, I, I'm picking up what you're putting down now. Yes, absolutely. He doesn't notice. He, sure, sure. He's pale. You can tell that he is terrified, but determined to put forth his best foot. Next comes Saul and Laura. The siblings both mirror the other and their expression of tight-lipped consternation. They're not happy to be in one another's presence. Laura has seemingly bucked tradition and has denied Saul the opportunity to take her arm and lead her. Uh, Her dress, as I mentioned before, is a little bit strangely fitting on her. She doesn't look comfortable with it, but she wears it nobly all the same, and her shoes, though clearly her finest, are already a bit muddied. I do glare at Saul. I don't try to hide it. (laughs) <laughs> he returns the glare. He's already in a sour mood, mm-hmm. but that seems to be par for course. Quite. Once they take their positions to the left and right of the altar, the bride and groom side, Father Atticus gestures for everyone to rise. Indeed, rise. do so. I rise. I have the patience of Job in my own mind, given my unfair seating assignment. <laughs> and the patience of Job aside. <laughs> so the band starts to pluck out a very twangy canon in D major. <laughs> Though their instruments occasionally flirt with the minor key, you get the sense that they did their best to tune them, but they're more used to letting their instruments speak authentic. And at this, Lizzie appears. She looks no less nervous, no less heartbroken than she appeared when you saw her in her room, but her jaw is set now, and When she looks at Samuel, something akin to relief crosses over her face. Mm. And he, despite his nerves, smiles widely at her. And it's a sickeningly charming smile. (laughs) She proceeds, her hands held low with a beautiful bouquet. Vines of which are almost trailing down to her feet, and walks to the end of the altar, and takes her place beside Sammy. Adam, you look like you want to say something. I didn't have anything in mind. I guess if I'm, I, I'm gonna say anything about what I'm doing. I, my, my eyes are fixed in what I hope is an encouraging expression on Lizzie. <laughs> 
She does glance in your direction as she passes you. And you see her lips curl up in a, a soft smile. She's clearly relieved and grateful for your presence. And with the procession at the front, Father Atticus, still gesturing for everyone to rise, dramatically brings his hands together in the universal symbol for prayer and bows his head, inviting everyone to join. And so I do. Players, do you bow your head? Yes. I do. I do, and I presume that I am plunged into shadow. Mm -hmm. Sort of. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> in enough to, that like I know the gesture but I don't I don't cry so, so your head you kind of do a fake bow of your head yeah it's sort of a yeah I'll look a little bit down without really glancing around Father Atticus begins the prayer almighty and everlasting one We gather before thee today on this longest of days to witness and bless this union of man and woman in marriage. Silas, you notice that a few other guests haven't really fully bowed their heads either. They're kind of doing the half furtive bow with their eyes open. Anyone notable? Anyone I recognize? No, the... There is... The couple that you spotted earlier that are kind of piously bowing their heads, but they're kind of glancing around. You don't get any sense of them looking maliciously. It more seems like curiosity. Like, they're hot. They can't really be bothered. Father Atticus is known for his long prayers. (laughs) Okay. Thou hast established the sacred bond, and I call upon thee, O Lord, to gild my tongue and loan your word in overseeing this union of blood. You might notice that Laura is looking at Samuel. Her head's not bowed either. And she looks mad. Honestly, at the mention of union of blood, I might get a little less reverent and start watching what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> so you also spot Laura looking at her brother with a, a stern, angry expression. Father Atticus continues. As we commence this ceremony, we seek thy presence among us. May thy unseen power descend upon this place, sanctifying this union and marking all who gathered here in fellowship. At unseen power, my head does not raise, but my eyes snap open. (laughs) Those of you peering around notice that a surprising majority of the servants who are kind of standing off to the side don't have their heads lowered either. Instead, they're holding hands. Hmm. Silas, you in particular catch sight of Amelia, who was not planning on being at this service, and her face is stricken with dread. Hmm. Now we offer up our own prayers in silence to safeguard and bless the union of these two young souls. There's a heavy silence that draws out at this point. It's only broken by the increasing drone of cicadas, but it's clear that you're supposed to be praying silently to sanctify the forthcoming union. So, I serve the green. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. You do. If there is an expectation that at this point I am praying, I think perhaps I am not praying as expected. That's fair. I, however, did not read ahead. (laughs) (laughs) So I guess I kind of leave it to you, old GM of Appalachia, what exactly I might be praying to or for. You are focusing on feeling connected to the earth under your feet the worms that feast there, Mm -hmm. the grass that grows there. Mm -hmm. 
But you keep finding yourself getting pulled away to the sound of the songbirds, the way that the nigh non-existent breeze that doesn't really do anything to cool off the air still manages to whisper through the pines and American chestnuts. You become so attuned for a moment that you can even hear some ants roaming through the grass or the cicadas, who at this point are hard not to notice with mm. your hearing, hearing so attuned. And for a brief moment, you think you feel panic. It's not yours. It's, it's not even the green at large. But something isn't happy. Mm. And I'll need an intelligence <laughs> <laughs> from those of you still looking around. So, I'm guessing that includes me. <laughs> yeah. I think it doesn't include me. Yeah. Hmm. So, Robin, you said a 19 also gets a major effect? A minor effect. Minor effect, okay. Yes. And you got a 19. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's definitely a success. We'll come back to you. Cool, cool. We'll come back to you was always such a reassuring phrase. Prior to rolling, uh -huh. I think I am going to go ahead and expend one level of effort, bringing my okay. in intellect pool down to seven before I roll. So mm -hmm. let me go ahead and roll. Twelve. You're both successful. Ed, we'll start with you. What you see is a face that you haven't seen here before, but mm. connecting with the green as you are, you kind of feel pulled towards it. There's, at the very back, even further behind where you're seated, a redhead. At a glance, she looks awfully young to be in attendance, but there's something that reaches into your soul and plucks at your heartstrings at the sight of her. Mm -hmm. The feeling of the uncanny. Silas, as you glance around, you notice the same individual. You see that she is gazing and blinking at Atticus with a look of disgust and rage. Her young face curled and creased with the expression. But even though her face is youthful in appearance, her eyes, not so. And as soon as you have this thought, she locks eyes with you. For those of you who weren't successful or weren't looking up, you don't notice this attendee. In fact, you might not notice anything at first. Unless you turn your gaze to the front. Laura starts screaming. And if you look to the front, you'll see what she sees, which is that Father Atticus is seizing. From his position at prayer, he's doubled over. There's spittle forming and dripping from his mouth in thick white foam. He falls onto the altar itself, causing the table to collapse as he goes to the ground, at which point Lizzie starts screaming as well. Point of order, where's the knife? Presumably fall into the ground as well. Okay. We have about five seconds to react. I'm going to say that the screaming draws my attention. I, I've sort of noted the, the redhead, but my head whips forward toward Lizzie in particular. Um, I don't guess I have any particular insight to what's going on, but I probably begin to move forward out of instinct as much as anything else. My glance flicks to the front, but then returns to the redhead in the back. In that moment, 
that it takes you to look forward and then backwards, she's gone. Sure, nothing is surprising here. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I enjoyed personally seeing the nod of resignation. (laughs) I mean, I knew there was an 80% chance here, and I didn't know what the minor effect was, and yeah. It's not like Silas knows any of this. He's not genre savvy. He's not savvy. (laughs) Right. Well, the scream obviously captures my attention first, and that's where I look, but then I scan around uh, best I can to look for both seen and unseen things. So you see what Silas feels, which is almost a rift, a stepping through. You're, You're not quite sure how to describe it, Because it's not something that you've encountered before. Because it takes a great deal of power. And not just of the power that you're familiar with. Mm. You don't realize it, but this rift is directly where the strained guest was seated. If we get through this moment, maybe we can compare notes later put the two pieces of the puzzle together but in the meantime what's everyone else doing drew when When i I hear hear when i hear father atticus fall in those five seconds the only thing i can do is ask the shadow what it thinks the shadow is furious so am i then (laughs) i start toward the altar without thinking so, Ed and Fielding are both moving towards the altar. Seems that mm-hmm. way. So, you approach Atticus. I think it's worth rolling a speed. Mm. And this is going to be just a comparative thing to give me a sense of who gets there first. Okay. <laughs> Four. Um, I. That's not you. <laughs> not uh, six. Oh, that's <laughs> it's not, <laughs> not you, me. but not by much. Yeah. yeah. So Ed reaches. Are you going to Atticus or Lizzie? Lizzie, decisively. <laughs> Atticus, decisively. <laughs> okay. Well, then it didn't matter. That was a fun, just tickle my fancy. <laughs> um, I'm not honestly power, a great perk. Of <laughs> so all GMs, all good GMs, are mad with power. Ed, we'll start true. with you. Um, mm-hmm. are you going to Lizzie to just comfort her? What exactly are you doing? Uh, if I remember correctly, she was screaming. Yeah, she was. Cool. So I am trying to essentially figure out what might be the matter, what I can do about it, and how I can help Lizzie. She is staring at Atticus. This is her uncle, and he is. He's flipped over to his back at this point, mm-hmm. his limbs contorting an angle that can only be described as painful and potentially dangerous. So I am moving between her and Atticus and sort of like trying my best to uh, comfort her and get her attention and see if she has any insight to what's happening as a sort of secondary concern. She locks eyes with you. They're still wide and rolling and Mm -hmm. terrified. And all she can repeat is, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Make it stop. Drew, you rush to Atticus. His back is arching now. It looks close to an angle that you've never seen a human manage before. His eyes are bulging from his head. He tries to look at you, pleading clear in his eyes. His mouth opens and closes uselessly as he attempts to breathe. The foam is sticking and rattling and his throat still continuing to pour out from his lips in a viscous, disgusting fluid. And then you correct yourself. No. It's not the wet gurgle of a death rattle that you hear. 
almost as soon as you have this thought, you see a mound of insectile legs floundering in the back of his throat. He grasps for you. It's more of pawing at you. His, his arms are flung out to the side. His wrists are contorted. The sleeve of his habit falls back to walls of wounds, some newly forming as mature cicadas burst from his flesh, shedding him in lieu of their exoskeletons, their black bodies, taking his color with them bit by bit as they emerge, gold-winged at first and turning ashen black, like something made out of soot. Their usual drone becomes his scream, magnified, repeated, hundreds of times over. And then his scream echoes out, getting picked up by the drone of cicadas in the surrounding woods, pulsating, repeating, and an ebb and flow. Without thinking, you grasp for him, and he crumbles beneath your fingers, an empty husk, as cicadas continue to pour from what remains of his clothing, what remains of his desiccated body. Atticus is gone. But his screams continue, growing ever closer. And you look skyward and realize there's a swarm overhead. Cicada's bodies blot out the sun, colliding with each other. They start to hit you. And just as you manage to bat off the first one, other human screams join Atticus's, not from the guests, though they're screaming too. It's coming from the cicadas, reverberating and echoing. Countless voices, crying out in anguish, anger, and grief, in deafening waves. And that's where we'll end our session. <laughs> God. Guess it's too late Damn. for the servants, friend. Ooh. Remains to be seen, I guess. <laughs> mm. I mean, it's a moot point because there's no hidden passage. So, like, <laughs> sure, bud. We proved it definitively. <laughs> oh. Correct. The passage is no longer hidden. <laughs> One of us has a sledgehammer. Mm -hmm. Oh, not the books. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> and that <laughs> concludes the session of dice pumps. Thanks for joining us. I hope our players and listeners enjoyed it as much as I did. Join us next time, won't you? If you're hearing us now, then you probably know where to listen to us. But we can be found almost any place one can listen to podcasts, as well as on the wider web at DicePunks.com and on co-host and Tumblr as at DicePunks. With that, I think we're ready to say farewell. So. Say goodbye to the kind folks and our Dice Punks family, players. You know, scream for the trees if you have a chance, but failing that, scream for the people. <laughs> Thanks for listening, and believe it or not, there are things at a wedding more important than how good your hair looks. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening, folks, and... Uh... I think my hyper focus on the potential uses of that knife I made were misplaced. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening. Uh, it is 10 p.m. Do you know where your children are? Do you know whether they're filled with locusts? <laughs> <laughs> God damn it, Nick. I'm so glad we have you go last. <laughs> <laughs> and as the poet once said everyone is waiting for the light be afraid don't be afraid the sun is shining out of my eyes it will not set tonight and the world counts loudly to ten. One, here comes the sun
Beloved listeners, thank you for tuning in. Stick around through the admin stuff for an excerpt from the Old Gods of Appalachia tabletop role-playing game introduction. I know that doesn't sound exciting, but it's a good representation of what the Old Gods podcast style consists of, so trust me when I say it's worth a listen. The main theme for this one shot, Older Than Bones, is by me, Robin Graves. It wouldn't have been possible, however, without Drew's kind use of his editing prowess and immense skills. You can find links to Drew's work in our show notes, and you can find me by pouring out some fine bourbon and offering to the oldest southern red oak. Editing and our campaign's rad new cover art was done by Joanne, who has appeared on the podcast now and again. Check out her work around the internet where she goes by anything sews. Site design, graphics for DicePunks.com, including the cover art for this one shot, are also by me. Let me know what you think by whispering your views to a feeding wake of vultures. The Old Gods of Appalachia role-playing game is by Monty Cook, Bruce R. Cordell, and Sean K. Reynolds. You can learn more by visiting MontyCookGames.com. The Old Gods of Appalachia podcast is written by Cam Collins and Steve Shell and produced by Deep Nerd Media. Pay a visit to Old Gods of Appalachia to join the family. Links to the system and authors can be found on the Punk for More section of our website, DicePunks.com. Thank you so much for listening. If you've liked what you've heard, that's reward enough on its own, but if you're so inclined, you can help us out by rating and reviewing us wherever you listen to us, telling your friends who you think would like us to give us a listen, and even by heading over to our Patreon at patreon.com backslash DicePunks. We have fun rewards available to backers, including a patron-only Discord, and access to the Dice Peaks after show for episodes 1.1 and following. Regardless, we hope you'll tune in again, and until then, remember, subtlety is for time. Appalachian. Say her name softly and with respect, if you speak it at all. The bones of our mother are sacred. They have been drenched with the sweat of toil and the blood of sacrifice. The place you stand now as an altar, built on the bones of those who went digging for something darker than shadows just to put food on the table. If you were born in these mountains, family, you know what seems beneath them. You have felt it pull on your heartstrings and tug at your innards any time you think of moving away. If you stay, then you have been seduced by that siren serenade as surely as if she stood at your shoulder and crooned in your ear. You listen to her as she whispers that home, home is where the heart is, while she holds yours clutched, bleeding in her talons. That road that leads you out of this place, all asphalt and yellow lines, paved and maintained by the county, can only bear you to damnation. But that road that carries you home? Blessed be that well-worn path, that holy back road, that marriage of gravel and cold earth that calls you back again and again, whether you mean it to or not. If you've come here from the outside, then you've already answered her call. Forsaking your flat lands and highfalutin cities, burrowing into her bosom like an invasive species, 
You were charmed by her hospitality, her sweet tea, and all the blessings of your poor little heart. You were captivated by the lush green of her rolling hills, the dappled sunlight beneath the canopy of her trees, the temptation to know what lies at the end of every shaded path that twists into the hearts of these hollers. Now you stand on the precipice of a void you cannot comprehend. You poor pilgrims are unprepared for the journey into our home, but we assure you, she is more than prepared for you.